I gave you a preview to this last class in section 2.1, but we learned that arithmetic sequences behave like linear functions and that geometric sequences behave like exponential functions. In fact, and I, I kind of made this connection throughout all of my classes the other day, but they are literally the exact form of equations you've always used for linear and exponential functions. So let me prove it to you. With your highlighter right now, I want you to highlight the D in the arithmetic sequence. Oh, that's not a highlighter. Let me actually highlight. And the slope in the slope intercept form linear equation. What do we notice about the D and the M? in regards to where they are in the equation. Are they by themselves or next to something else? Great, they act the exact same. The common difference tells you how the sequence is changing. The slope tells you how the function is changing. I want you to go ahead and highlight the A sub zero and the B. A sub zero tells you that that's the zero term a.k.a. where it crosses the y-axis, where x is equal to 0. The b value in a y equals mx plus b formula has always been your y-intercept, so that is the exact same. And then I want you to take you to third highlighter color and highlight both a sub n and n, and then f of x and x. What do you notice about what I've highlighted in green? They kind of look the same-ish, yeah? a sub n, f of x n and x, they're both describing the name of the function or the name of the sequence, a and f, and then your variable, either n or x. Cool, fabulous, awesome. That is your slope intercept form or your basic version of an arithmetic sequence. But if we look down, there's a connection between the version of the arithmetic sequence we use the most on our homework and point slope form. So again, let's find our slope and our common difference. We recognize they're in the same spot, yeah? They're in front of the parentheses. They work the exact same. In this one, we're not highlighting a y-intercept because it doesn't tell us, but we're gonna go ahead and highlight the a sub k and k, and I, or y sub i and x sub i. And normally, that would say like x1, y1. It's just saying i because it could be whatever number you want. It really doesn't matter. But notice, again, that my coordinate point I'm plugging in is in the same spots. If you're like, Miss Quigley, that is not point-slope form. It really is. Normally, point-slope form is y minus y1 equal to m times x minus x1. I realize that. All they've done is taken this y1 and moved it to the other side already and made it positive. So it's still point-slope form. It's just solve for y. Do we see the connection between the linear equations and the arithmetic sequences. So we've really just been doing linear functions this whole time. We just called them sequences. We'll do the same thing with uh, geometric sequences and exponential functions. Again, with your highlighter, probably the same color used for slope, I want you to highlight the R in geometric sequences and the R or the B in exponential functions. Depending on your textbook, some textbooks say a, b to the x, and some textbooks say a, r to the x. Honestly, it just depends on your textbook. But notice, they're in the same spot. They are the thing with a power. They are my growth factor or decay factor. They're what I'm multiplying by in the sequence or in the function. With your highlighter for the um, y-intercept, you're going to highlight g sub 0 and both of the a's in this function. Again, those are my initial value or what the function starts with on the y-axis. And last but not least, we'll highlight our coordinate point, which is g sub n and n, f of x and x, and f of x and x. Notice, they're all in the same spot, whether you're talking about a sequence or you're talking about a function. So really, again, when we talked about geometric sequences, we're really just talking about exponential functions. We'll do the same thing for, it's not called point slope form because it's not a slope, but it kind of feels like the version where you could plug in a coordinate point along the curve, which is a great way to call it. We're gonna highlight the R and the R in both of these. 
and not the initial value because it didn't give it to us, but the y sub i, x sub i, g sub n, I mean what, g sub k and k. That is my coordinate point, air quotes, that I'm plugging in that goes along this curve with a certain r value. So again, whether we use the formula for the sequence or exponential function, they work the exact same. Sequences, you just don't connect the dots because they're discrete. Okay, we see the similarities and differences between geometric sequences, exponential functions, and our arithmetic sequences and linear functions. But what about the differences between these two types of functions in general? You've studied these before. We know that linear functions are tilted lines on our graph, either with a positive slope or a negative slope. What do exponential functions look like? Do we remember? A, curve. a little curve, yeah. It's a curve where if it's growing, it looks like this. Or if it's decaying, it looks like this. I just drew those in the wrong spot. Let me do that next to the name, actually. OK, so we have our shapes. We know what they should look like. Linear equations are lines. Exponential functions are curves. We've got our formulas here again. We'll highlight the important bits. This is the y-intercept and the y-intercept. This is your slope. This is your rate of proportionality or how it's changing, your factor, growth factor, decay factor. And here's what's going to be really important. Today I'm going to ask you questions and leave. I have been giving you um, sentence stems up till now where you fill in like one or two words. We've got to get to the point where we write the entire sentences ourselves. So today you're going to be writing a lot of math sentences all the way by yourself. This little section right here, put a little star next to it because this is the section that will help you write the sentences that I want. For linear functions, over equal length input value intervals, the output values of the function are going to change at a constant rate. That's the words I should see for you to explain why a certain piece of data is linear. That yes, it happens to change at a constant rate, but more specifically that literally we're going to write over equal length input value intervals, the output values change at a constant rate. We're going to write all of those words. If we recognize something as exponential, the words that we're going to write is over equal length input value intervals, the output values change proportionately. Like we're multiplying or dividing by something proportionally. But that makes a lot of sense to us because we learned last time that sequences change by some sort of addition or subtraction, which is addition of a negative number. And exponentials or geometric sequences change by multiplication or division, which is just multiplying by a fraction. That means that we're changing either by a constant rate with addition or by some proportion with multiplication. But of course, if we have those two points, which I've been highlighting in green in all of my functions, if we have those two points, we can write any equation for linear, exponential, arithmetic sequences, or geometric sequences. Cool? Okay, so again, if you're confused on what to write as an explanation for me on the problems where I ask you to explain your answer, you're using the box that we put the little star next to. Those are the sentences I need to see for my explanation. All right, flip it to the back. Ah, uh, tables. They're back. Now this time I'm not asking you to figure out what degree polynomial it is, which we did really well on. This time I'm asking you to determine if it's linear or exponential or neither. Not to go further and determine what kind of polynomial it is, but just these few. But the steps are still the same. I want to take these y values that are all separated by equal length intervals, plus 3, plus 3, plus 3, plus 3. I want to see how they're changing. I always like to start with addition and subtraction because my brain goes there first. If I were to be using addition or subtraction, how do you go from 7 to 5? Okay, cool. How do you go from 5 to 3? 3 to 1. And 1 to negative 1. Okay, cool. All of those numbers are the same. Last time we did sequences, we called that an arithmetic sequence since they all changed by the same number. But we're now talking about what function it is. 
So since it changes with this constant number, we're going to say that this is linear because, and here's where that sentence comes in. So you're going to have to use your small handwriting, all my friends, because over equal length, input value intervals, input value intervals, the output values of this function, this function based on the table is called f of x, change at a constant rate. So it's linear because we have a constant rate. But to write that for me, we've got to use all those words. We are saying that we are looking at a table that all the x values are changing at a constant rate. It's not a tricky table. But we notice that all the y values are changing at that constant rate. We're going to use all of those words to describe that. OK, looking at the second table. Again, I notice quickly that all the x values change in an order, a specific pattern. To go by one every time, that's great. So I'm going to, again, I always start with addition. How do you go from 0 to 1? How do you go from 1 to 4? And then 4 to 9? And then 9 to 16? 7. Were all of those numbers the same? Don't get it twisted that that looks like a pattern. It does look like a pattern, and when we were studying polynomials, you would have gone to a second difference and noticed this was quadratic. But that's not what we're doing here. If that first difference is not all the same, we back up, we say, all right, that didn't work. Let's try multiplication and division. What do I multiply to go from 0 to 1? You can't. You can't. Yikes. So we can't even do that. All right, so what would we answer this with? Neither. Now, again, my brain automatically found out that it was quadratic because I knew about second differences. But that not, that's not what this question is about. So we would say this is neither because, and we still have to give an explanation. It's very wordy, but we got this. Because over equal length, input value intervals, The output values of and this function is named g of x. If I'm looking at the table, the output values of g of x do not change at a constant rate or proportionally. spelled that wrong. Proportionality. There we go. Oof, a lot of words, I know. So again, do you see how it's the same verbiage from that front table? We just added do not. And since it does not change by a constant rate, not linear, and it does not change proportionally, which is exponential, that's how we write the sentence. Okay, C and D are going to be for you. So when you're done writing this one down, go ahead and look at tables C and D. Determine if they're linear, exponential, or neither, and then practice writing the sentence that answers that question. Okay, sorry if I'm cutting off your thinking, but here's what I would have done for this question. Again, my brain naturally goes to try addition and subtraction first. So it'll go from 2 to 1, or sorry, 1 to 2, that's plus 1, and then I'd have plus 2, and then I'd have plus 4, and then I'd have plus 8. Obviously, those are not the right numbers. Oh, it just died. Okay, so now that my thing is back connected. So obviously, those are not the same numbers with addition and subtraction, so I would erase and try again. If I use multiplication or division, this would be times 2, and then times 2, and then times 2, and then times 2. Fabulous. So we have the same number. That means for sure that the, this data set is exponential. Cool, but just telling me that is not it anymore, we have to give an explanation. So we'd say it's exponential because over equal length, input value intervals, 
just saying that all of the x's change at a constant number. The output values of, and what is this function called? I can't see it. h of x? Yeah, h of x. Change proportionally. Let me try that again, actually spelling this word correctly. All right, there we go. Sorry about that. Okay, cool. For the last table, what did we find for that one as well? Exponential. So if you tried addition and subtraction, it wouldn't work, but you could multiply by a half for all of these, and you'd go in the pattern. So just like with geometric sequences, since it changed with a multiplication or a division, which is multiplying of a fraction, this is also exponential because, again, over equal length input value intervals the output values of k of x change proportionately. Cool, yeah? Questions about that? I know the concept itself is not hard, deciding if it's linear, exponential, or neither. But the explanation itself is very important. Like I said before now, when we did this with quadratics to determine which difference was all the same, I gave you sentence stems for it, so you just had to fill in words. Now we actually have to remember all of the words. Let's go to example two. In example two, it says, a wild rumor is spreading that Miss Quigley won the third place world's strongest woman contest. I wonder who tried to start that rumor. Oh, could it be me? The number of people who have heard the rumor can be modeled using a geometric sequence, where 43 people had heard the rumor on day three and 140 people have heard the rumor on day six. Really not spreading very fast. Thought it would take off, whatever. According to the model, how many people to the nearest whole number have heard the rumor by day 10? Now it says that this can be modeled using a geometric sequence. But when we talk about geometric sequences, we know that it's really like an exponential function. So whether you use the geometric sequence formula or the formula for an exponential function, you are doing the same work. So here's how we're going to tackle problems like this. First of all, we have to define our function. Since we're talking about the number of people that hear the, the rumor, we're going to call our function P of N. It's going to stand for the number of people who have heard the rumor on day n. n because that's the variable I decided to use. If you happen to use an x, you'd say on day x. So p of n is going to be the number of people who have heard the rumor on day n. Now we know some pieces of information about this rumor. The two pieces of information we have is that on day 3, 43 people had heard the rumor. And on day 6, 140 people have heard the rumor. That is two points. Just like on our homework problems we did at the beginning of class, we said g sub 3 is equal to 43 and g sub 6 is equal to 140. This is the exact same thing. So we're going to do the same thing like we did on our homework problems earlier today. And we're going to fill in the exponential function or the geometric sequence formula that we have. Because I want you to start remembering the geometric sequences, we're going to write them down again. This is g sub n equal to g sub k times r to the n minus k. I know that it's on the other side of your paper, and I know that we have it in both exponential and sequence form, but they're the same function. We know g sub n, g sub k, n, and k. 
which means we have enough information to solve for R or the rate at which this, fun this rumor is spreading. So we're going to do that just like we did on our practice problems today. We have 43 equal to 140 times R to the 3 minus 6. Actually, can I back up for a second? This is going to be an ugly problem if we do it this way because uh, we would divide 43 by 140. Let's use them in the opposite direction. So instead of that, let's do 140 equal to 43 equal to r times 6 minus 3. Just like slightly prettier. Also, then my, my uh, what's that called? Exponent is positive. Sorry. All right. We did this at the beginning of class. What's the first step to solve for r? Divide by 43. Now this does not turn into a pretty number, so we're going to leave it as the fraction. 140 divided by 43 equals r to the third power. How do you solve for r? Cube root both sides. Okay. Now again, I said this at the beginning of class. Instead of writing cube root, we can raise it to what power? One third. This will be helpful when the power is bigger than three and you don't know how to put a cube root in the calculator to just use the reciprocal power. Okay, cool. Go ahead and put that in your calculator for me, please. 140 divided by 43 raised to the one third power. And then don't write anything down yet. So a reminder for something about this AP class, we're not going to round numbers until the very end. This is the first time we've gotten one of these ratios or rates factors that's not a pretty number like 2, 5, negative 2, those sort of things. So now we need to use some of our calculator skills to hang on to this number so that we do not round it too soon. On your calculators, there's a button you've probably always ignored down here. What does it say on it? STO. It means store. I know it doesn't have all those letters. But it will allow you to store values in your calculator to use later. So right now, after you've pressed enter, and your calculator says 1.482130781, whatever, you're going to press store. And if you notice, the calculator has written, I'm going to take your answer, which is this, and I'm going to store it as whatever letter you type right here. What letter are we using in this problem? R. So look on your calculator for where you see R. R is a green thing above the multiply sign. So you press alpha multiply and it's going to type an R. You press enter and the calculator's like, cool, got it. That value without rounding it is now stored in your calculator as the letter R. So if I happen to type the letter R, it's going to be like, pow, there it is. If I do 3R, which is not helpful in this problem, it's going to multiply that number times 3. So you don't have to lose your number or round your number too soon because you will miss problems in this class if you round too soon. So we store crazy values. Again, where is the button to store? Above on, and you do have to put a letter after it. I recommend not using X ever because X is constantly changed in your calculator and stored as different values. Use the letter that makes sense for your problem, like R or M or D or P, I don't know. Okay, fabulous. So we'll hang on to that for a second. Now we have this value for R. If you wanted to on your notes, write down what it's approximately equal to. You can just so you know you found it. But we are not actually using that rounded decimal. We're going to use the full stored value. If you need to write down for yourself what you did here, remember you say store value. That's huge. Now again, if you get a cute little number for R, like 2.5, that's not rounded. You can use 2.5. But if you get a decimal that goes off your screen, you've got to store the value to use it later. And the reason we need that is because when we go to write our actual equation here for P of N, we would say that P of N is equal to 43 times 140 divided by 43 raised to the one-third power. That's what we stored in our calculator to the n minus 3 power. 
Now again, this ugly stuff that's in here, we just stored it in our calculator as what letter? R. So instead of writing all of that and confusing myself, I can just write it as R from my calculator. That's my stored value. Now the question here is I want to know who's heard this rumor about me by day 10. So we're actually finding the people on day 10. We're doing 43 times my stored value R to the 10 minus 3. Don't trick yourself into thinking that's a variable. Capital R we have stored in our calculator. So all we have to do is go back to our calculator and actually type that in. We would say 43 parentheses alpha R close parentheses raised to the 10 minus 3 power, which I know is 7. Pow. I didn't have to retype all that ugly stuff to get a decimal. I didn't round my decimal, but I still used the full thing. That's really important. So about how many people have heard this rumor? It says, it, the problem does say, and this is like just generally what you do with people. Don't round people to halves. You can't have half a person hear a rumor. You're going to round it to the nearest whole person. So you would say 676 people have mostly heard that rumor by day 10. It, it does say to the nearest whole number. Does this feel exactly like the kind of problems we did the other day? Yeah, they're the exact same. We're just now using an exponential function for it as well as a sequence because the, they work the same. All right, example three. A large theater has rows of seats where the number of seats in the, each row can be modeled by an arithmetic sequence. Ooh, arithmetic sequence. That's like a linear function. If the fifth row has 31 seats and the 11th row has 49 seats, determine how many seats there are in the 25th row. All right, here's what we know. We gotta name our function. I'm gonna name it seats per row, which is the number of seats in the nth row. You could use whatever letter you wanted as the value or the beginning of it, like S of N. Just don't use I, don't use E, don't use X. Yeah, those are about the only ones. E and I are numbers. X of X would be weird, so just don't do that. Okay, the information I know is that the fifth row has 31 seats. I also know that the 11th row has 49 seats. But since this one is arithmetic, and I'm wanting you to start to really memorize those arithmetic sequence and geometric sequence formulas, and since they're the exact same as a linear function, we're going to plug it into the version that looks like this. a sub n equal to a sub k plus d times n minus k. Again, we know that a sub n is like s of n, and a sub k is like another point on the line. So we plug in what we know. This would be 49 equal to 31 plus d, I don't know it, times 11 minus 5. Did I lose anybody right there? Did we follow? Because we did those practice problems at the beginning of class, plugging it all in. At that point, I only have one variable, which means I can solve for it. 49 minus 31 is 18. 11 minus 5 is 6. So when I solve for my common difference this time, I don't need to store this value because I didn't have to round it. So unlike question number two, where I had to store that value R, I just have to plug it in. Okay, so now we have D. It does not matter which of the two points you use to plug it back in the formula. I like to leave these exactly where they are and just put the A sub N or S sub N back in there. So my formula is S of N equal to 31 plus 3 times N minus 5. But of course, not asked for generally the formula. I'm asked to find the numbers in the 25th row. 
Last class I made you reduce this. We're not gonna do that anymore. We're just gonna go ahead and plug it in. That's all numbers, which means at this point, just like we did when we had the giant R in our formula, we can just straight up plug this in. 31 plus three times 25 minus five. Go ahead and throw that into a calculator for me. How many seats are in that 25th row? Ninety one seats, yeah? So again, the problems today are very much like the problems we did before. I mean literally the same. We're just considering them to be functions instead of sequences. But they work the exact same. So our practice today is gonna feel a lot like our practice from last class. And maybe that helped us be able to finish our practice from last class.